And I know that we're gathering in the sanctuary and we also have well wishes and rest of the church family um, on YouTube, later on Facebook and even CD. So I wish you all a wonderful Sunday and uh, it's a nice sunny day, still a little bit chippy, chilly, but we're moving forward. I don't know if, if anybody sort of monitors sunset and sunrise. I do, just to keep me going. But warm greetings in any case. Uh, just to remind you, we have um, our usual weekly activities. On a Monday and Saturday, the prayer meetings continue, and that's by telephone, teleconference, 7 o'clock, so tomorrow, 7 o'clock, and Saturday coming, 7 o'clock. Also, the Bible study by Zoom on a Thursday at 8 o'clock, and um, if you're interested in any of these two activities and you're not sure how to get on, please contact the office, or you may know a friendly soul who is in regular touch and they can help you. So that's Bible study and prayer meeting. I'm also pleased to announce that the luncheon club has restarted, thanks to Lilith and her team of people that she's putting together. Now, it's... Um, a cautious start, windows are open, masks are being worn, but it's a wonderful midweek opportunity. On a Thursday, 11.30 to 1.30, and you may well ask, what's on offer? Well, on offer is a fabulous two-course meal. Every week, it's something different. There is pleasant company, nice conversation, a timely word of scripture, and sometimes the occasional surprise activity. So please come along. It's primarily for those who are retired, but not exclusively, not exclusively. So if you find yourself at a loose end on a Thursday, 11.30 to 1.30, please come along. You're assured of a very warm welcome. Um, also, I want to ask that we Remember our Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, as she commemorates her accession to the throne 70 years ago. 70 years ago. I, for one, have known no other Queen, and I'm sure that is the case for many of us here. So please remember her and her household and extended family. They are royalty but they have the same challenges as we do, 70 years. Um, and lastly, just to say, uh, if you've brought your offering with you today, then there is a basket in the foyer on your way out. You're very welcome to leave it. I think that's everything. And um, yes, I'm always remiss in my manners. If there's anybody visiting us for the first time, or who hasn't been in a long time, especially warm welcome to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather again. And Lord, as we come in to worship you, to give you praise, to give you glory, to give you honor, we leave the challenges of our daily lives outside. Lord, we just come clinging to the cross, and looking for your mercy, looking for your love. Heavenly Father, we pray that each person gathered here this morning, and in fact, people gathering in every Christian community across the country, and indeed across the world, will hear from you personally, Father, as they gather for worship. Lord, I ask that you remember your servant Stephen as he comes with a message. Lord, that you would speak through him, that he would hear from you what he has to say. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity of freedom to worship, and we pray for those who may not have that same opportunity. Father, bless us as we gather and worship you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Let us stand now for a call to worship. Let us stand. And this week, it's in two parts. The first part is already on the screen, 
And when we are through, we will all say the Lord's Prayer together, also coming up on the screen. Beginning. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day when he can be found. God of all, breath of life, living water, savior, friend. Come as the hungry, feed on his word. Come as the thirsty, drink of his love. Come as the faithful, worship the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And please remain standing. We're going to carry on with um, two songs of worship, praise and worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Um, I'm sure everybody knows it. And... Um, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day. And we're going to be singing now. He's got the whole world in his hands. We acknowledge God's sovereignty and his great love for us. Yeah, these are great songs. And you children who are here today, uh, they're really specially for you to help us sing our hearts out to the Lord. He's got the whole world in his hands. Sometimes we think that God is far away and that he's not involved with what's going in. But this song reminds us he's got everything in his hands. He's got the whole world 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 in his hands. He's got the little tiny baby in his hands. He's got the little tiny baby in his hands. He's got the little tiny baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister. In his hands, he's got you and me, sister. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got everybody here. In his hands, he's got everybody. 
everybody here. In his hands he's got everybody here. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain. In his hands he's got the wind and the rain. In his hands he's got the wind and the rain. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the sun and the moon. In his hands he's got the sun and the moon. In his hands he's got the sun and the moon. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands he's got the whole world. In his hands he's got the whole world. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. Amen. Yes, please take a seat, and we start as we mean to continue. God is everything. He's got you and me, and me and you in his hands. And now it's time for children and young people to leave us. If you're under 13, this way, please, and over 13s to the back. I think Pastor Isaac is waiting. Ah, yes, new development. If there's anybody with a younger child, maybe two, baby, um, if you need a quiet spot at any point, we now have a space just outside in the prayer chapel. You can sit quietly and still follow the service on the monitor. So if any younger children who may get a little restless, there is a space. Now I'm going to ask Sabrina to come to lead us in our intercessory prayers. Thank you, Sabrina. Good morning, everyone, and at home, uh, let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for this day, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you have the whole world in your hands, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you woke us up this morning knowing that you had a plan and purpose for us to be here today, Lord, and, and hear your word and learn more about you, Lord. Lord, there are so many things that we can come to you for this morning, Lord, but we just want to intercede on the behalf of those, Lord, who are in need, Lord. Father God, I just want to commit to you those around the world who are unable to worship you freely, Lord who have been persecuted by their families, by the laws of their country, Lord, because they believe and worship in you, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will continue to keep them, Lord. You will guide them, Lord Jesus, and remind them of your promises, Lord, that none of your words will come back void, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you continue to strengthen them and work on the hearts of those that are persecuting them and in charge of those countries and laws, Lord. Father God, Coming closer to home, Lord Jesus, we can see that there is so much uproar with our own government, Lord Jesus. We can see that the hearts of man, Lord, is, is at the forefront of people's minds, Lord Jesus. And you can't seem to be seen, Lord, within the midst of this, Lord. But we know, Lord Jesus, that you will win, Father God. You will prevail, Father God. No matter what law comes in, if it's not in your will, Lord Jesus, it will be undone. Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus, for the ongoing situation with uh, our government, Lord Jesus. We're praying for Boris Johnson, Lord Jesus, that whatever it is that he's battling with, Lord Jesus, that you will be there for him, Lord Jesus. You will continue to guide and lead him, Lord Jesus. We're praying for those, Lord Jesus, who have continued to be sick over this period of time, Lord, and haven't been able to be with loved ones and have fellowship and community around them, Lord Jesus. We're praying, Lord, that over the next few weeks that things will continue to ease, Father God, and people will continue to see the love and the support that you have for them, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling with their health, that they're relying on you, Lord Jesus, and trusting in you and your will, Father God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the provisions around them, Lord, whether it be the health care, mental health care, Lord Jesus, that you have provided for us. Without these things, Lord Jesus, we don't know where we would be, but we are grateful. 
Father God, I pray for those who are working in those professions, that you continue to strengthen them, Lord Jesus. When they are weak, Lord, you will make them strong. When they are struggling and doubting themselves, Lord, you will remind them of who you are and who they are in you, Lord. Lord, I just want to lift up every family represented in this room, Lord, online, at home, Lord Jesus. I'll just pause for a moment, Lord, that we can allow each person to lift up someone that's on their heart, Father God. Someone that may be a colleague, a family member, a child, Lord Jesus. You know our hearts, Father God, and you know exactly what we're crying out for, Lord. So please, Lord, just uh, grant us to call out a person's name, Lord Jesus, that's on our heart that we want you to reach, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, that you know our hearts, you've heard the names and the families that we have called, Lord Jesus, and we believe that you have done it, Lord Jesus. Whatever it is we've asked for, you have done it, Father God, and we thank you. Father God, I just want to lift up Edmonton Baptist Church to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for our ministers, for the leadership, Lord. You know that each person is going through their own hardships and journeys, Lord Jesus, but I pray, Lord, that they continue walking in your path, Lord Jesus, and you continue to keep them. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for all of the work that Edmonton Baptist Church is doing, Lord, with the homeless, Lord Jesus, with the luncheon club, with the English classes, Lord Jesus. We are trying to reach your loved ones, Lord, all over the world. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that through our, our outreach, Lord, that hearts will be changed. People will know your goodness, Lord Jesus, and turn their lives to you. Father God, I thank you, Lord, again, for allowing us freely to come into your house and worship you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be opened and softened, Lord, to the word that is to come. And I pray, Lord, that our lives will be changed in the way that you need it to be, Lord. Father God, I thank you again, and I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Sabrina. And now we're going to continue with our praise in song. The Lord loves to hear from us. And Pastor Stephen will lead us with a video, Great is the Lord. Let us stand, please. Great is the Lord. Oh, 
your seats and I want to at this point just give thanks to God for his provision of everything that we have including our offerings so let us pray Heavenly Father we thank you once again that we are in your presence and we thank you for all that you have given us from the bounty of your mercy Thank you, Heavenly Father, for food, for clothing, for shelter. And thank you for the financial provision. Lord, as we receive our gifts today, we pray, Lord, that they would be used for the extension of your kingdom in this place and around the world. Lord, we thank you, and we give you praise and honor for all that you have done. Amen. Uh, Julia will now uh, come to the front to deliver our Bible reading. Morning, church. Today's scripture reading is Esther 3, verses 1 to 15. Haman plots to destroy the Jews. Sometime later... King Gertzes promoted a man named Haman to the position of prime minister. Haman was the son of Hamadatha, a descendant of Agag. The king ordered all the officials in his service to show their respect for Haman by kneeling and bowing to him. They all did so except for Mordecai, who refused to do it. The other officials in the royal service asked him why he was disobeying the king's command. Day after day, they urged him to give in, but he would not listen to them. I am a Jew, he explained, and I cannot bow to Haman. So they told Haman about this, wondering if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct. Haman was furious when he realized that Mordecai was not going to kneel and bow to him. And when he learned that Mordecai was a Jew, he decided to do more than punish Mordecai alone. He made plans to kill every Jew in the whole Persian Empire. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes' reign, in the first month, the month of Nisan, Haman ordered the lots off to be cast, Purim they were called, to find out the right day and month to carry out his plot. The thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, was decided on. So Haman told the king, there's a certain race of people scattered all over your empire and found in every province. They observe customs that are not like those of any other people. Moreover, they do not obey the laws of the empire, so it is not in your best interest to tolerate them. If it please your majesty, issue a decree that they are to be put to death. If you do, 
I guarantee that I will be able to put 375 tons of silver into the royal treasury for the administration of the empire. The king took off his ring, which was used to stamp proclamations and make them official, and gave it to the enemy, and gave it to the enemy of the Jewish people, Haman, son of Hamadatha, the descendant of Agag. The king told him, the people and their money are yours. Do as you like with them. So on the 13th day of the first month, Haman called the king's secretaries and dictated a proclamation to be translated into every language and system of writing used in the empire and to be sent to the, all the rulers, governors, and officials. It was issued in the name of King Xerxes and stamped with his ring. Runners took this proclamation to every province of the empire. It contained the instructions that on, the single day, on a single day, the 13th day of Ada, all Jews, young and old, women and children, were to be killed. They were to be slaughtered without mercy and their belongings were to be taken. The contents of the proclamation were to be made public in every province so that everyone would be prepared when the day came. At the king's command, the decree was made public in the capital city of Susa, and runners carried the news to the provinces. The king and Haman sat down and had a drink while the city of Susa was being torn, thrown into confusion. This is the word of the Lord. So very shortly, Pastor Stephen will be bringing us today's word based on the reading we just heard, Esther chapter 3. But let us quieten ourselves, quieten our hearts, and bring to mind exactly why we're here, and again, thank God for all that he has done from us. So we have a video called A Letter from God. Please listen and watch prayerfully. A Letter from God. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I'm familiar. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. For you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. 
delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I love that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. Nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love, your dad, almighty God. lovely reminder of God's uh, father love towards us and uh, we need it more and more in these days don't we in which we live uh, I hope uh, Julia won't mind me saying this but um, I think probably for you some a video like that uh, reminds you very specially uh, Julia uh, she can tell me off afterwards for saying this but at the beginning of COVID, Julia became very, very sick indeed. And it was touch and go whether she would survive. And uh, many, many people prayed, uh, myself uh, and ministers of this church, but all the people in this church who knew about this prayed fervently that God would intervene on her behalf. And it's absolutely wonderful to see her standing here doing that Bible reading this morning. And we want to give thanks to God, don't we? He's not changed. He's the same God he always was, and he still does miracles. He still heals us. He still sets us free. So we thank our Heavenly Father this morning for his wonderful love towards us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we continue uh, the story today from the book of Esther. And uh, we said right from the beginning, the book of Esther is a bit like a soap opera. And characters keep being introduced and they interplay together in an amazing way. And uh, today we're going to be thinking about the dangers of power and of hate. The dangers of power and hate. Something that all of us can actually lock into and hear God challenging us about. Because in chapter 3 of Esther, which we're looking at today, we introduce what you call the villain of the peace. And his name was Haman. And uh, we see right from the beginning of chapter 3 that King Xerxes promoted this man, Haman, to a position of real power, a po the position of being the prime minister, the second in command in the whole of the Persian kingdom. And I think right from the start we need to say it's very important that we choose our leaders carefully whether it's the person uh, we marry, whether it's the uh, businesses that we might be involved in running and employing people, whatever it is, we need to choose leaders carefully because the potential consequences of this appointment of Haman could have been catastrophic, as we shall see a bit later on. And uh, when power and kudos come together, there can be all kinds of trouble. Uh, I was going to mention, but I decided I shouldn't mention, I think Boris Johnson and uh, 
Mr. Cummings were probably, uh, well, they were a good match, weren't they, really, or a bad match, depending how you look at it. And we see that in the story of Esther as we go through it, that Haman and the king, the leaders, were not chosen well, and uh, we, will, we will unpack that as we go along. But we want to ask the question, well, who is this man, Haman? Why is he so important in the story of Esther and the saving of God's people? Well, Haman was an Amalekite. He was a descendant of Agog. And Amalekites were historical enemies of the Jews. You can find that in Exodus chapter 17. In Saul's time, God actually instructed Saul to destroy the whole family of Amalekites. Uh, Agog, but uh, he didn't do that. And there we see now uh, history coming back to, re to revisit this trouble that was coming through this man, Haman. But also, uh, Haman was obviously a very wealthy man, and he was in love with power and the kudos that goes with high office. I don't know if you're in a position of responsibility over others, and Maybe you're not quite the prime minister or his uh, key advisor, but maybe you have responsibility for other people. Maybe you're a father in a family, a husband in a, a marriage, uh, a teacher in a school, uh, many, many things. But Haman loved the fact, the kudos that went with being in a position of power and office. And his appointment made him second only to the king himself. So imagine the power that he had, particularly in those days. And how we exercise the power and the influence that God has given us is the difference between a great leader, one that we're grateful for, and an evil dictator, isn't it? In the world, we see the difference between a Nelson Mandela on the one hand and a Kim Jong-un on the other, where Kim Jong-un was only concerned, his only concern of displaying great monu monumental pictures and statues of himself, what we call the cult of personality. And this has gone through generations. At one point, uh, members of his own family were opposing him, and so he had them uh, removed, literally removed, exterminated. Um, the difference between a Nelson Mandela and a Kim Jong-un is the way we exercise the power that God has allowed us to have. So if you're a leader in your place of work or in your home or in society, in any con context, pray, pray today from this story that God will help you to use that power and influence wisely and to the benefit and the blessing of those under you. Um, Beverly referred earlier to the fact that today is the 70, 70th year of the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. It's her platinum jubilee. And uh, it was interesting to just read what she wrote to the nation in her speech uh, yesterday. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. It wasn't a long speech, but this is what she said. And this is to you, to us, to the nation, uh, this nation. She said, as we mark this anniversary, it gives me great pleasure to renew to you the pledge I gave you in 1947 that my life will always be devoted to your service. Isn't that a wonderful thing to say? A wonderful thing to say. And then she signs it, your servant, Elizabeth R. Um, I wonder if Kim Jong-un could write the same speech or many other world leaders. I, I shouldn't pick on them, should I? Uh, because we're all guilty of failing in, in our responsibilities so often. We're all sinners who need the touch of God's grace. Uh, but it's interesting to compare that speech with many others that are going on in the world, even as we speak. So as Prime Minister, Haman was given a chair. Uh, we used to have a big chair here. I'm not quite sure where it disappeared to. It's somewhere in the building. A rather posh chair that's carved and the pastor was supposed to sit on the posh chair, and then there were slightly less posh chairs for the deacons. And, uh, <laughs> but in life, there, there are chairs, aren't there? And, and Haman was given literally a chair, and it was lifted up. It was exalted on a podium just to show that he was this elevated person who had real status. 
and it was a display of his high public office. And his primary concern, uh, unfortunately, was entirely selfish, as of hap often happens with money, position, and power. Something goes wrong. Scripture says, doesn't it, the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. You can do an incredible good with money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And here, Haman, you can picture him sitting in this special chair, lifted up on a podium, and people had to pass that way every day. And as a mark of office for the respect for the office of Prime Minister, Haman, people would bow as they passed. Uh, in the same way, if you went to, to see the, the Queen and she was going to give you a knighthood, uh, you, would, you would bow just to, to respect the office that God had allowed her to have as Queen. So people would bow as they passed Haman. Uh, but Haman took this much, much further because what he did was he expected the people not only to, to do this, but to bow and prostrate themselves before him as if he was God, almost asking them, demanding of them that they worship him because look at me, I'm sitting on this special chair elevated and I'm second only to the king himself. You, you must bow before me. He wanted not just the respect for the office that he held, but he wanted people almost to worship him as if he was a god. And he obviously loved it. And the people were too frightened to do anything else. Um, maybe we've met people in life like that who love the office and who almost create fear in us if we don't uh, do it the way they think we should do it. Um, and in order to preserve their lives, most people, when they went past Haman sitting on his chair, they went along with what he expected them to do. They bowed almost in worship and prostrated themselves before him, all except one person, and that person was Mordecai. And he said, I am a Jew, he explained, and cannot bow to Haman. Uh, he refused to bow and prostrate himself before Haman for two reasons. One, because as a Jew, he knew he was to worship only God himself. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 to 5. But also, as a Jew, he would not bow down to a man whose people, historically, had set themselves as enemies of the Jews for hundreds of years, bowing to exterminate them. Now, when the news came back to Haman, he was absolutely furious that this one man, Mordecai, would not bow before him. And when he realized and learned that Mordecai was a Jew, he was not only furious, he was absolutely enraged and he, he lost control of his anger. Have you ever done that? Have you ever lost control of your anger? Have you ever harbored something that is so hateful that you've fed it and you've, you've made it, you've made it bigger and bigger, and then there comes a flashpoint where it all comes out, what you really feel about that person or those people? When, when Haman learned that Mordecai was a Jew, all the history came back and how his, his uh, ancestors had fought the Jewish people. And he was enraged. And he fed his anger to the point where not only had he decided to destroy Mordecai, but he wanted to exterminate all the Jews from every part of the Persian Empire. Uh, that's happened many, many times, hasn't it? In modern history, the Jewish people have been attacked so many different ways, and it's become almost uh, this rage that seethes under the surface against God's people, the Jews. Even though very often Jews are a tremendous blessing in every area of community life. He decided not just to get rid of Mordecai, but he decided he was going to exterminate a whole race of people. Now that's what happens when you feed hatred. 
So Haman was an evil man. But in verse 7, we then discover that he was also very superstitious. I don't know if you consider yourself superstitious, but he would only take important decisions if he consulted the astrologers. You know, how the stars were moving in relationship to one another. And he was looking for a lucky day. A lucky day that they could predict was a good day to take this action against the Jewish nation so that he would have the desired outcome that he wanted. Uh, it's interesting, many years ago, my first real trip abroad was a short trip to India. And I went to the city of Jaipur. I don't know if anyone's been to Jaipur. But uh, in Jaipur, there are all kinds of things related to watching the stars. Astro uh, uh, astrology symbols and uh, things where you see how the sun shines down in relationship to the other heavenly bodies. Because in Hinduism, Hindus are very superstitious they consult the stars to see what is a good day for a good outcome in your life. So Haman consulted the astrologers and he found the date for this mass extermination. And it was set by casting lots. The word Purim is casting lots. And Purim was small stones thrown down, a little bit like we throw dice, that would indicate favorable outcomes to the actions that we take. Now, we might think, well, we'd never do anything like that. That's a primitive thing to do, isn't it? To throw stones or to look at the stars and think that something lucky is going to happen on a certain day. But, of course, we do exactly the same things, don't we? In our world, in our modern technological world, we consult horoscopes sometimes to see if, good, if it's a good day today for romance. Of course, you don't do that, do you? <laughs> Tarot card readings are becoming very popular. I noticed on the television one of the adverts saying there's a new magazine in 100 parts at 9 99 a week, 100 parts, all about tarot reading. Uh, we don't do those things anymore, do we? Yes, in, as a society, as people, we still consult things that God has told us not to consult, to see if it's a good day for the thing that we want to happen. And even some who would claim to be Christians seek out false prophets who they pay money to because they believe that if they pay money, they will get a favorable prophecy from the prophet, a prophecy that they want to hear. You remember a few weeks ago, we were talking about... Uh, how Isaiah said that, you know, Isaiah, the prophes prophecies in the Old Testament of the prophets that we know are from God, people didn't want to hear the bad news they were, were giving out. And they told them, please, just be quiet and let us hear someone is going to give us a good prophecy. Those are the ones we want to hear. But there are still many Christians who they think if they pay a, a prophet, then they will give them the kind of reading that they want for the thing that they want to happen. Now, we don't do that, do we? Well, I don't know. Some of you who are football fans will remember a certain animal called Paul the Octopus. Anyone remember Paul the Octopus? <laughs> Why am I mentioning him in a church service today? Well, Paul the Octopus, uh, he was just an ordinary octopus who was minding his own business, but they discovered that uh, he supposedly predicted the results of association football matches. Uh, I don't know what you make of that so far, but uh, he made many predictions that actually came true in the 2010 World Cup. Would you consult an octopus? Uh, I don't know, but many people put bets on and so on and uh, depended on the octopus. And what, what they did was... They reckoned that he was some kind of uh, animal oracle, some kind of link to the powers in the universe. And Paul's keepers, they would present him with two boxes containing food, and each box was identical with the food, except on the top of each box there was a different team flag for the competition that they wanted to know was about to take place, the football match. And whichever box 
Paul the octopus chose to eat from, then you could bet on that and you, you were likely to, to win, win your gamble. Of course, we don't do things like that anymore on these primitive things. We might note here that every year the Jews celebrate this festival of Purim, which recalls how God intervened to save his people from extinction at the hands of Haman. And in the synagogue, as the story of Esther and, and Haman are told, then everyone boos when the name Haman is spoken, just to remember this man who was so evil, whose anger was so fed and so festered inside him that he sought to destroy all of the Jewish people. And let's think about this. If, if Haman had succeeded, then we, we wouldn't have had a saviour, would we? Because it's from the Jews that our saviour, the Messiah, Jesus, came. Um, so the favourable date, uh, interestingly, that the astrologers gave was the day before another event very special to the Jews, I don't know if you know what it was. It was the Passover, the commemoration of Passover. And it's amazing to think how God presents us with these stories that are interlinked to teach us this, these great truths. Because as he saved the people in the Exodus from destruction by the pursuing Egyptian army as they were set free by God from slavery, so too now they're about to be exterminated by the hate of this man, Haman. Is God going to save his people again? The answer, as we go through the story, is absolutely yes. God will always save his people. So once the favourable date was predicted, Haman then went to the king and tried to manipulate him into doing what he wanted to issue the extermination order against God's people, the Jews, in every part of the kingdom. We see that in verses 8 and 9. He did this by lying and by offering the king a sweetener. Uh, of course, that doesn't happen these days anymore, does it? No. No bribes anymore in our world, are there? Out of his personal fortune, Haman offered the king 10,000 talents of silver. Uh, 340 metric tons of silver, estimated to be worth in excess of 153 million pounds. You know, King Xerxes, if you just give me your ring, your signet ring, so that I can send an order out to deal with the enemies of the state, then um, I'll be very pleased and I'll give you 153 million pounds. Uh, what's so shocking is that the king, in total dereliction of his duty, thought, oh, that's nice, you know, windfall, I didn't expect. He takes the money. He's not really interested in what Haman has said at the time. He just says, yeah, borrow the ring. He could have done anything with that ring because that ring gave permission for anything that was in that order to be executed on the order of the king. And he just gives him his power. I oh, will do what you like. Yeah, I've got the 153 million pounds. Here's the ring. Give it back to me when you've finished. Is that the way leaders should exercise their power? Whatever that leadership is. And so he gives him the ring, and uh, King Xerxes is glad that his, his personal wealth has suddenly increased in this amazing way. Of course, Haman knew very well, and the scripture tells us here, that he wasn't going to lose a penny of that money because once he'd exterminated the Jews, he wrote in the order that all their belongings were to be kept and put in his private bank account. So he knew he wasn't going to lose the 153 million pounds because what he stole from the Jewish people after exterminating them would easily fill his coffers again. He wasn't going to be short of money and so off he went and he wrote the order out very carefully and it must have cost a fortune to send this out to every part of the Persian Empire. It says in every language that was spoken that on this day the Jews were going to be exterminated and all their goods would be stolen. And it went out, they sent runners out to every area of the nation, of the empire, 
so that every single Jew could be exterminated. That's how much he hated Mordecai, how much he suddenly remembered how he hated these long-standing feuds that they'd had with the Jews back in the day with his relatives and so on, and he was going to make every single one pay for that. That's what anger does when we feed it. That's what hate does when we feed it. That's what unforgiveness does when we feed it. Um, So uh, King Xerxes gave him this icing on this cake because, yeah, he could write anything in that order. He could recoup all the money in the process. Of course, we've seen that as well in modern times, haven't we? When Hitler went against the Jews, as he sent them to the gas chambers, he stole all the things that were of any value from them paintings that disappeared, uh, any, anything that was worth anything was stolen as he exterminated six million Jews. It's a story, a hate repeats the story in lots of different ways every day in our world. Haman was not a nice man. And what is astounding is that Xerxes, instead of being a leader like we've just read, what Queen Elizabeth II, our queen for 70 years, said, you know, I devote myself to your service and I will continue to devote myself to your service. King Xerxes didn't care. He was rich, no one could touch him, so he thought, he went along with the idea willingly. Um, Shocking example of leadership. And it says finally, verse 15, it says, After deciding on this genocide, the king and Haman sat down, shared a drink together. I don't know. They went to Costa Coffee. Would you like a latte or, or, or a cappuccino? Let's sit down, relax, and have a drink together. Um, quite obscene, quite shocking. And here was a clear order to commit genocide on a massive scale. Ethnic cleansing, we would call it as well, wouldn't we? Um, There's a constant danger when people can exercise power over other people without being accountable. We are sinful people, and we often use our power in the wrong kind of way. And since that time of Esther, the story has repeated itself over and again, Ethnic cleansing has continued with amazing regularity in every decade. Sometimes to grab land, sometimes to purify a religious ideal, sometimes in an attempt to protect an indigenous culture from what they see as aliens coming into their country. And sometimes it's just historical hate that has never been dealt with in the heart. And so it repeats itself year after year after year. In the 1940s, Nazi Germany, persecution, expulsion and genocide of six million Jews. In 1972, Idi Amin ethnically cleansed Uganda of all its Asian population, even though they were doctors and uh, people who contributed so much to the welfare of their country. He just cleanse the country of them. In 1978 and 9, 500,000 people were forced to flee Vietnam because they were ethnic Chinese people. In 1987, Saddam Hussein massacred 187,000 Kurdish civilians, gassing them with chemical weapons, his own citizens that God had allowed him to rule over. And 90% of all Kurdish villages were wiped out. In 1994, one million Tutsis were massacred by Hutus in the Rwandan genocide. And so it goes on. The Bible is so down to earth, isn't it? It It reflects the wickedness that lurks in all our hearts that we have to just give over to God and ask to change us from the inside out. Um, Power can be a very dangerous thing. And Haman used his power, his privilege, to play out his personal hatred of the Jews. And if his plans had succeeded, as I said earlier, then we would not have had a Messiah or a Saviour. We would not be sitting here today as people who can be saved from hell and saved for heaven through 
the sacrifice of Jesus. And behind the scenes, there is one who pulls the strings of history, uh, seeking to destroy what God is trying to do. Satan is there. Ephesians chapter 6 very clearly says, we're not just wrestling against human powers, uh, but we're wrestling against principalities and powers at a whole other level. Um, I pray that none of us will be manipulated by the enemy to do the wicked things that our hearts so often incline to. I want to challenge each of us today. Are there things right now that we need to deal with in our own hearts? Are there people in your family who long since you've decided you're never going to talk to them again because of what they did to you? Some things uh, we can understand the hurt and, and the result of that hurt, but God doesn't want to hang on us to hang on to that. It kills our own soul. That's why Jesus told us to forgive, wasn't it? It isn't just to let the other person off. God can deal with that. He's a God of justice. Every hurt that's been done is accountable to God and he will serve justice in his time. But if we hold on to it, if we feed it, then we are killing our own souls. And uh, maybe there's something in your life that you need to ask God to really help you with, to deal with. Um, This is right down to earth. The story goes on, though, to tell us that it was on the very gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai, that Haman eventually was hanged. We'll see that another week. But a Jewish tradition says that the hanging tree on which Haman was hanged was a thorn tree. And uh, the custom goes, this is an anecdote, if you like, that was passed on through Jewish uh, stories, was that that the thorn tree was the only one that would accept Haman. He was so evil. The only one that would accept him was was the thorn tree because he was so, so bad. And ironically, and here's God's hand at work, even when we think the world is falling apart, Ironically, in time, Haman's grandchildren, many of them converted to Judaism. Some of them even became rabbis. Pointing people uh, to God, calling them back to faith in God. I don't think Haman would have liked that one bit. He would have turned in his grave where, at least. So let's remember this morning, whatever power we have comes from God but it comes with a great responsibility and not as a right. God gives us power so that we can serve his purposes, not to serve ourselves, not to give ourselves kudos or a sense that other people are somehow below us. But we can so often abuse that and distort it for our own selfish ends. Matthew 20, verse 28, Jesus says this, And please take hold of this verse. If one of you wants to be great, he must be the servant of the rest. And if one of you wants to be first, he must be your slave. Like the Son of Man who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, the story of Esther is a powerful story. Lord, we see the temptation that we so often have when we have money, when we have power. We love the kudos of those positions. And somehow, if we don't control those powers with your help, then those powers will eventually control us. Lord, forgive us for the grudges that we are still holding on to. And Lord, if we have been hurt deeply, and and many have been hurt deeply, Lord, we're just asking you to begin that process in us because at the moment we might be finding it impossible to imagine that we can ever let go of that grudge. But Lord, we want to be like your son Jesus, who committed his cause to the one who judges justly. And he refused to retaliate when they abused him with abuse. 
And Lord, if we are in a position of any kind of power, in our marriages, over our children, in our places of work, in our public office, in business, whatever it is, if we are in a position of any kind of power, Lord, help us not to abuse that position, but to treat it with tremendous respect and ask for your help, Lord. We thank you today, Lord, for the testimony of our Queen, who every Christmas tells us that the centre of her life what has kept her going all these years is a personal faith in your son, Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord. And we thank you that in this 70th year, she has told us a wonderful truth, that she has devoted her life to serving the people that you've allowed her to have a measure of power over. Lord, we thank you for that example. Lord, may we in a desire to glorify the name of Jesus. Lord, serve others, because that is the mark of greatness in your kingdom. Bless the people that you've given us influence over, Lord, so that your purposes will be fulfilled and your Son will be glorified. Help us if we're struggling with these things, so that our lives and our decisions will indeed glorify you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Stephen. Um, nothing to add at all. I think it's been said. Let us take heed. Let us stand now for a final song. There is hope. And when we've completed the singing here, remain standing for the blessing in song. There is hope. There is hope in the mighty name of Jesus. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope in the mighty name of Jesus. There is hope, there is hope, I am mighty name of Jesus, there is hope, you're my strength, there is hope, and my soul, there is hope, I am mighty name of Jesus, there is hope, you're my strength, there is hope, and my soul.
make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and keep you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sit down, gather yourselves, 